Welcome to The Human Project, your podcast for inspiring stories. I am Corina Rosa Falkenberg. I'm here in the jungle and I'm at the entrance of a huge bamboo house. In a second, I will speak to Dino. He is not just an entrepreneur, but also a builder of ecosystems. This is why he has created the bamboo house. And I would like to find out today what is required to build it and what is required to live in it. Let's get started. So mm. Dino, it's a pleasure. Thank you. Um, I met you today, actually just an hour ago. I arrived here because uh, my friend uh, Imogen, she said, you have to come and meet Dino. The space is incredible. How would you describe the space we are in? I would say it's harmonious with the uh, nature, the environment. I would say that it's uh, organic. Mm -hmm. I'd say that it's sort of feng shui-like. Mm. So there's uh, no square boxes and lines everything is curved even the pool i wanted it to be curved so that it flowed with the the river below it and then the roof lines i think are quite architecturally beautiful because they flow with the the shapes of the of the landscape around it so i find that um, the intrinsic and complex and artistic um, design um, arch architectural design flows very well mm -hmm. with the nature that surrounds it, that we're in. And I think that was very important to create that synergy between myself as the client and the architect who mm -hmm. came up with the overall design concept that uh, fits that description. So when I arrived earlier here, I parked my motor bicycle, I stepped in and I just was like, wow. When we met, I said, I need to digest what's here because there's so much to feel, to see, to hear. We had to find a quiet room because we are in the middle of nature, so it's beautiful. You can hear the bird, you can hear water. And then you can see this beautiness of the architecture because, as you said, everything is round and it's made out of bamboo. And there's so much to see, but it's peaceful to see you know what i mean sometimes you see so much and it's too much it's overloading mm. this was not the case this was giving me calm and yeah again peace when i looked at it mm. and still there are so tiny small things to see like how the bamboo is stick together or like the ceilings that was it was made out of woven material um it's it's a space where i felt like right from the beginning being home and being back to what makes me being a human somehow. I felt like this urge to touch everything, like, you know, like this, very tactile. this different, yeah. I think we use, a, well, all the materials that we use here are very mm -hmm. natural. I think that's pretty important to, to know that even the walls are uh, rammed earth, which is a combination of different aggregate materials and one of them is being the mud from or the mud and the land, the mud from the land, the earth and gravel and sand and limestone and just a little bit of, of cement to sort of hold it together. But otherwise, it's all it's a sustainable product. All the the woods that are used are sustainable, and uh, everything when we built the place was sort of thought out carefully about what to use and why to use it. And I think. Uh, the environment that we're in is makes a big difference too. So, the land um, for me reminds me a lot of Bali, or what Bali meant to me. Which mm -hmm. is, you have been here something like quarter of a century already, twenty five years. Well, almost that me, long. Right? Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've been coming here for that long, but mm -hmm. I never lived here for as long as I have this time around. Oh. I used to just come over to visit Canada for a few weeks at a time. Like me. Like you. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so this land or this 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 place that you've created mm. reminds you a lot um, of Bali itself. What does yeah, Bali, Bali mean for you? For me, it's never usually been about the beach or the ocean or the mm, surfing because I'm not a surfer, and, <laughs> and 
and uh, you know the beaches that I'm used to are more Caribbean, which is are white sands and beautiful, mm -hmm. and here they're more black sand. But for me, it was more nature related. So it was uh, river, rice fields, mm -hmm. jungle, waterfalls. We have all of that here. We have the we're in the rice fields, jungle, river, mm -hmm. and our own waterfalls. And our own waterfalls is actually very magical because there's two. There's two connecting water sources, and in Ubud or in Bali, um, it's considered very spiritual. It's called Champuan, when the two rivers meet. It's a very magical and spiritual energy that, that mm -hmm. that's here. Combined with the fact that we've we've uh, had a lot of Balinese ceremonies to appease the spirits, mm -hmm. to appease the energies, and that comfortable feeling that you feel when you're here. Is partly because of that that energy that exists that surrounds us, mm -hmm. the positive spiritual energy that that surrounds us, as well as I believe it's my nature to the way I grew up, with my background being Italian and French, to be a a good host and have the place that you're in being very comfortable. Mm -hmm. So you feel at home. You don't feel that you mm -hmm. you could put your feet up and feel comfortable and and being mm -hmm. in the space. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think this is what you said just right now. It's very important. Like you're hosting that space, you're allowing people like me to feel home, right? This is a beautiful gift. And as I travel a lot, also professional wise, I'm very often in places where I don't feel that. Where it's more the energy is different. It's just a place to sleep. It was built out and up to offer accommodation, but there is not the soul within. Even if you don't have kind of this beautiful nature architecture and sustainable architecture, you can feel that there is something missing, you know? Yeah, and I believe mm -hmm. that um, places with a soul or with that intention, and of course, in addition with those beautiful pieces from nature, give you a different mm, feeling for the moment, for awareness. It allows you to be maybe even more yourself. I would like to go back, you said, like, you haven't been to Bali, like, on a permanent, uh, permanently the last 25 years, but now it was longer. So we are in your room right now here. How is it for you when you have stayed in a beautiful place now longer? How do you feel when you are now really fully live in that sustainable environment? Do you feel a change versus back home? I've um, learned to um, feel blessed about being here, actually, uh, mm -hmm. for as long as I as I am this time around, especially with the conditions of the world these days, uh, back home or the Western world is sort of really having a hard time with this pandemic. And I feel very blessed to be here and to be able to enjoy this environment, look look out the window and see palm trees and have a swimming pool by my side and or in front, or all water features, wherever, and being a part of nature, and and being able to do yoga, and and to eat well, and take care of my health, I find it's a really good environment for that to be here. And at this time, um, for as long as I have, I feel uh, grateful to be here mm -hmm. during this time. Mm -hmm. And do you also feel? Where do you usually live? Back home is? Back home. My home is Toronto, Canada. Wow. I've never been to Toronto, but I, I imagine it's also a big city, right? Yeah, it's a big city. It's also oh. very cold in the wintertime. Yes. Mm. Canada. <laughs> um, so how is it when you are now here and you're living with such like a natural material, like what you just described? Can you feel that for you as a human being, it's also different on the long term when you are surrounded by this kind of environment? Yeah, for sure. I mean, back home in Toronto, I was lucky enough to create a similar environment. Ah, so I, I was inspired by by Bali and my house was, I designed my house to be inspired. Lucky you, I didn't know that. <laughs> no, and I, my, the area that I live in is very green and very wow. lush. Mm -hmm. And um, I have a lot of space in my mm -hmm. backyard. I have a pond, I have... Mm -hmm. Fish. I have all the because I was in the furniture business. So, so actually, you knew about the impact that uh, a queen environment would have on you. I. Uh, what happened that you were aware of that? What happened that you that you found out? I need that to really be in a healthy condition. 
yeah, I was I created that space back home as I was saying in uh, in in the design feature, and I think mm -hmm. for me one of the one of the first features that influenced me most about being in Bali was the outdoor bathroom concept or the outdoor oh. the the the, the uh -huh. being able to yeah. live outdoors. Yeah. And um, whether it's living or dining is sort of what I really mm -hmm. enjoy, or mostly bathing out outdoors. So the villas I've created before, I created some other villas, I built some other villas here in Bali uh, seven, eight years ago, and they have that space. And so my house back home in Canada also has that space where I live, as long as the weather's nice in the summer, I live outdoors. And uh, when I live indoors, when it's colder, uh, it has that feel of being outdoors based on how mm -hmm. I've decorated it, decorated my space. I even have a waterfall indoors. So I'm, I've always been attracted to having nature, the sounds of water around me. And so uh, this time around, being here for as long as I have, I was able to be introduced to a different lifestyle and also introduced to um, juicing and fasting mm -hmm. and mm -hmm or juice fasting as well, and and uh, living a more of a balanced lifestyle within this environment. And mm -hmm. uh, here at uh, at Ulaman in my resort, um, we have a beautiful yoga shala. And so um, from the beginning of August, I've been working on doing yoga every day or different types of mm -hmm. activities and, uh, and being a little bit more self-conscious and aware of Eating or eating healthy and living a healthier mm -hmm. lifestyle. Mm -hmm. So I think it's easier to do that here mm -hmm. in Bali mm -hmm. than it is mm -hmm. back home. Mm -hmm. So it's not just um, the accommodation, the housing, but also the whole lifestyle that you follow. And I could not agree more. It's much easier here in Bali. Even I'm regularly on detox, even if it's just like not eating something for dinner. Yeah, and have just like a couple of hours stomach empty. It feels so good. Um, I can, I totally hear you. And I remember when I was um, on Bali the first time more than 20 years ago, the first thing I got was this open bathroom with a bath, bath tube. It was in Ubud and it was Yeah, in, mine was in Ubud too. Yes, I was fascinated. Mm. I loved it. And there was this red, red little flower decorated there. So loved it. I know, they had all those touches back yeah. in Ubud and back in the day that we were there. It wasn't that expensive. And no. I didn't have an air conditioned room, it was just a fan, but I remember going outside and looking at the stars and going, wow. Yeah, yeah. I'm able to shower outdoors yeah. and look at the stars. Like, that is phenomenal. Yeah. So I've always loved that aspect. Mm -hmm. So here at Ulaman, my mm -hmm. bathrooms, all my bathrooms have that outdoor feel mm -hmm. that uh, reminded me of when we were back, <laughs> back here 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. I was in one of the bathrooms there, amazing, really amazing. So you told me just before that um, your family is very special. You told me that your family was teaching you already when you were young to have not only a kind of independent lifestyle, you, 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 you said to me like at the age of eight, for your mm -hmm. mom it was important that you know how to cook so that you can be independent. Mm -hmm. I really like that concept to give kids at a young age already the idea of becoming independent. But at the same time, you said, yes, we had a strong family bond. Mm -hmm. This is maybe not a balance that is easily to be found as well as parents. You want to teach your kids to be able to make their living on their own. Mm -hmm. At the same time, you want to keep them. So how? what was the success of your family model that you were raised independently but nonetheless in a strong community well that's a that's a good question i think um my brothers and i my two brothers and i are uh influenced or directly and we're definitely impacted from how we were raised we were lucky to have parents that were dedicated loved us um, raising us my mom was the one that fought for her independence and she was also the one that She was independent. She fought for independence in her, in her marriage with my dad. <laughs> so they argued a lot about that. <laughs> um, and she taught, my mom taught us to be independent and to fight for what we believed in. She also believed in fighting for the underdog and for those who were less fortunate. Mm -hmm. 
So that's sort of my, what my mom, how one of the many aspects my mom influenced us in. And my dad, he, um, he wanted us to work more with our mind and our hands because he grew up working with his hands. What did he do? Um, back in Italy, he was a tailor. So he was the Italian, right? My dad was Italian. My mom was French-Canadian, yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, my dad was all about family, all about eating together. Oh, I love that. And uh, long when they, when they got married, my, he, my mom was not able to cook f f for my dad the way he was expecting it to. So when she tried to make pasta, oh. it came out like mashed potatoes. Oh. He complained it was just way overcooked. So she's like, oh. well, you can cook for yourself then. So he became the cook of the family. And so we inspired uh, me and my brothers to cook. And uh, he was also a great host and would bring people in and everybody was welcome and it was very mm -hmm. Italian that way. And he was the singer, the dancer, the philosopher. And, uh, but he was also the one that said, uh, well, the independence was my mom, with the, but the side of, my, of being independent with my mom was to, to do, to, to work for yourself. And for my dad, it was to work smartly and not, you know, with your hands as he put it. So it was to work more with managing money or but we were we we were influenced more in real estate so when when i was coming home from high school one day um he'd asked me if i knew how to calculate interest rates and i said no they don't teach that in school how old were you oh i was 17 i think wow. and he's like yeah they don't teach that in school pop he's like well you should learn like, oh, how do you how do you <laughs> learn well then you should do a real estate course so i became a real estate agent to, Wow. Got my license at 18, and then, mm -hmm. um, and then so I was trying to sell businesses. And one of them that um, I ended up um, trying to sell to my cousin, he convinced me to be his business partner, and so I started my first restaurant when I was 18 years old. But uh, prior to that, um, we got a start. We, my brothers and I, got a start. Uh, my dad... Um, had uh, put a down payment on a on a very very small house, a few thousand dollars, and and said this is how you're going to learn. So I learned how to renovate with him, and wow. I learned how to manage tenants. I learned about the real estate laws, and I learned all about business kind of firsthand. And uh, and then I learned how to manage properties and how to invest in real estate. But. Uh, but we remained close, as you were saying. So the family always remained close. So every Sunday we would get together as a family. We would eat together, whether it was lunch or dinner, or spend the whole day together every Sunday. And then uh, when my parents passed away, we kept that tradition with my brothers. So we still, when uh, we're in the country and able to, we meet every Sunday. We rotate each other's houses and we have big family meals. And so, yes, I was taught by my mom of a very young age to be independent and how to cook and clean and so both my brothers and I we we can all cook we can all clean we can all do you know we can all do what we need to do in the house but uh, and now my ne my nephews and nieces are taught sort of the same way mm -hmm. that we were taught so to be independent they learn how to cook how to clean and so how to help around the house and uh, and have our share our fair share of outdoor activities as well not just you know they're not just on their devices mm -hmm. and, you know all, all day like kids can be so they're encouraged to be outside and play together as cousins so we kept that tradition and we still keep that tradition beautiful mm. it is very beautiful. lucky i picture that right now <laughs> yeah we're very very lucky yeah. i think we're very lucky to mm -hmm. have to have had the family and the parents uh, that i had because a lot of people don't have that mm -hmm opportunity to even eat together you know is something that's kind of rare and foreign but it was something that my dad mm -hmm. being from that culture yeah. really made sure that we were we ate as a family and we drank wine as a mm -hmm. family and you know this is what i love so much about the italian culture because i do have also some interests some italian interests mm. and my cousin is married to an italian and there i have this italian influence always sitting together I love it. Yeah. It takes hours to finish dinner. Yeah. It's amazing. It's yeah. full of everybody's talking. Yeah. They're talking. They're talking <laughs> yes, loud. They're they talking. sound like they're arguing. Yes. And, and sometimes they are and sometimes they're not. And sometimes you can't tell the difference yeah. if they're arguing or not. Yeah. 
How was it? Because you said before your mom, she was born in which year, if I may ask you? Oh, what year? God. Because you were a bit older, just a bit, than I am. Yeah. And when, so, when, what, what year? Uh, 29, I think. 1929. So, 1929. So, how was it when, because you described your mom as being kind of modern woman, huh? saying uh, like, okay, if it's not good enough for you, then please do it yourself. How yeah. was it for you to live through those, with an Italian, I can imagine, in addition, fights uh, between your parents? What did you feel when you were younger? Would you have loved to have more harmony, or was it, on the contrary, something you learned? It's important to have conflict because it's human, and we have just to manage it. What did you take out of that? Well, that's a good question. Um, It's, I think, you know, seeing my parents argue a lot, we couldn't really understand it. But now that I look back at it, I think it's my mom. I think they were, they were together uh, 24-7. So that's, and, but there were times my dad went to leave for the summer and that time they'd spent apart was very good for them. Mm -hmm. But um, I felt that in relationship they were, my mom especially was fighting for her independence, for her to be her and not mm -hmm. to be judged. And and so she just kept defending for her, her culture, her French-Canadian culture, which my dad would criticize maybe how they were. But my, my, dad, my mom had her own points. But uh, I think we are um, we are a product of our, of our parents. Mm -hmm. One thing that my dad um, definitely taught us, I think, which was very special, was that, you know, uh, the parents... Um, are the foundation, you know, we're like the tree trunk, or the, 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 the tree trunk that, you know, we, 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 ra we were raised from. And uh, um, we, we can take the good, mm -hmm. um, and we should take the good and leave the bad of what we learned from our parents. Mm -hmm. And that the branches, that's for us to branch out, to be our own, um, our own person mm -hmm. and to learn from you know they're like no we you know there's stuff that we did that's not right you know we we didn't necessarily didn't have parents you know or my dad didn't have didn't know his dad so he was doing the best he could so he said mm -hmm. look take learn from what we what you you know from our good and leave the bad and branch out and be yourself and, excuse me I think that was very valuable to mm -hmm. have that analogy mm-hmm And so uh, I think that's what we've done. And uh, as we've done that, we've, we've taken the good from what our parents have taught us and left out, you know, whatever, th whatever we didn't really want to keep and, and have be part of our lives for the moving forward. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well said. Thank you. So when I now have a look on your life, if I may, you have um, four restaurants in Toronto, still ongoing business? No, um, I had uh, f I've had four restaurants yeah, over had, over okay. over a period of my life, um, and uh, up till about I don't know five or six years ago, and then mm -hmm. that was it. I kind of sold off mm -hmm. all the businesses that I had, which had employees. And the last one, um, I had a furniture store that uh, that also a furniture store. Yeah, it was called Cuda Furniture. <laughs> um, it started for me shopping to uh, in Bali. For myself oh. and then it got out of hand mm -hmm. and then buying four 40 foot containers longer story i know i have to jump in because before i mean i had another question in mind but now it comes to that one because you said like i asked wow this is so beautiful this resort here you said you have six villas and three rooms in the main room in the main eight and three in the main house okay yeah. even more and i asked how did it happen and you said Oh, it just went out of my hands. I wanted to have it for myself, and then it became a bit mm. bigger because there is the friend's room and so on, and then you just wanted to share. And the original question was like, having restaurants and such a beautiful space here is also something to build up a community. Yeah, It's like your family, like Italian roots a bit, to have people coming in, feeling comfortable. Mm. Yeah. Um, so... I think the restaurant business um, is sort of an extension of mm -hmm. how I grew up, you know, welcoming people, how I grew up yeah. learning to welcome people and hosting and uh, seeing people enjoy food 
and laughter and mm -hmm. and drink. So important. Absolutely is. And there were so many great stories that were created in in the 30 years that I've had restaurants back home um, in Toronto. The first one I started when I was 18 um, from the real estate uh, career. And uh, there was other businesses that I was involved in, like theatrical costumes. I was grew up as a childhood actor. But uh, the furniture one, um, like you said, it was an idea that got out of hand as well. <laughs> Started shopping in Bali when I first came here, um, and it was an economic crisis in 1998. And uh, I just started buying stuff for myself, but I, you know, didn't know how to ship it, so I looked into shipping, and uh, it looked like we were the best way to ship personal goods that were going to be safe and arrive safe and, and not damaged, and for the best value was to put it in a container rather than a crate which is uh, called LCL, which is you're shipping a crate of stuff and it could get broken, damaged, and thrown around in different containers. So uh, not knowing what a container looked like, I started buying like I had a lot of room and I bought so much stuff, I didn't stop buying. And then I realized, well, I was over a 20 foot container, so I had moved into a 40 foot. And then long before I knew it, I was into f two 40 foots and then I went back home, um, long story short. Came back because uh, the shipper was really not doing a good job. And I ended up buying two more 40-foot containers, realizing that now it's more than just a personal garage sale that I'm going to be doing. It's got to be turned it into a business. I can't believe it. Because you said before, like, you have to think big. This is actually a bit like the same idea. Huh? It became big and it became and turned out to be a business. Our friend who's waiting now outside, she said, yeah, you know, that's it. This is what you're about. Mm. You're just not only dreaming big, but you make it become profitable at the end. Right. M make it to become a real business working. Right. What's the secret behind? I don't know about a secret, but for me, my philosophy is when in life, I've always wanted to do something because I liked what it represented. So for me, the food, the restaurants... Furniture, I like beautiful things. I really like the idea that you can decorate your home mm -hmm. and feel comfortable in that space. So you had passion for it, those products. Yeah, mm -hmm. I had passion for it. I mean, I, had, I did. Mm -hmm. I did. I didn't realize I had that much passion for furniture until I started digging into it deeper. Interesting. Um, and for me, um, I never went into businesses because of profit or because money was my main motivation. It was based on, I will, I think this is something I really want to do. I think the most important part, or you'll call it the secret, is that it has to be viable, otherwise it just becomes a hobby. So even though money was never my main objective, money is the byproduct mm -hmm. that businesses are judged by, sort of like a monopoly game. So it's a game you treat it like a game and so when you make money at it you have to learn how to make money at it and what's the best way to make money at it? then it becomes a business and a business again is measured by profit so then it has to become all right let's play this game so it becomes mm -hmm. viable and i continue doing what i want to do mm -hmm. and grow the business and have it be successful and profitable so by that, then money comes into play and then it becomes a profit. Then it has become profitable mm -hmm. to be, become a business. I think this is very important because very often it is um, said, go where your pleasures are, go where your passion is. But this is not sufficient. This is exactly what you said. You have to have, nonetheless, a certain kind of um, business uh, layer over it. Structure, yeah. discipline, mm -hmm. and uh, infrastructure for for it to grow and so i've i've never had a resort before so I've, i'm <laughs> learning how to do that at the age of may i disclose it uh, uh, in, in my 50s in my 50s <laughs> i still love it and you were not afraid of nonetheless start something totally new so far away from home no, no. like the idea of failing and uh no i've never been afraid to fail it's mm -hmm. never been an option for me although i, I know like that opinion it's never been an option for me to fail This is something that I take for myself as well. Like, mm. I love that. When I was learning for my first legal exam, I, it was clear I have to pass it in a good way. 
I never thought about what would happen if I would fail, and 50% of the students don't pass it. And I think this fear is not good because with this fear, another option comes up, the option mm -hmm. to fail. Right. Thought, you know, they say I love it, thought is, is creative. Mm -hmm. So when you think it and you, enter, you, you allow that thought oh. to enter it, then it manifests and becomes real. Mm -hmm. however, small, however, however big that percentage is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think, um, of course, you know, somebody can't say, well, of course you can fail. Of course, mm -hmm. that's a reality. It absolutely is a reality. It's not that I'm ignoring it or that you've ignored it when you're doing your exam. But we don't let that manifest. We don't let that grow into a point mm -hmm. where it becomes, you know, where mm -hmm. fear controls. And of course, I think that's why a lot of people don't go into mm -hmm. business because of fear, of fear mm -hmm. of failure. Some people have other issues, which is called fear of success. <laughs> but there's a lot of fears that may stop us in, in being successful. I don't look at failing as an option because um, it's all just a learning process. So for me, it's just a learning process. You can't fail at learning something new. It's all new. Mm -hmm. So for me, I've learned about the new building materials. I learned about how they build here. I've learned how to trust Mm -hmm. um, the building methods here rather than trying to micro, I'm not sure it's micro, macro manage them and try to think that I know best because I come from the Western world. Mm -hmm. um, so I had to learn that part in building it. Mm -hmm. But I didn't look at anybody else and say, oh, that's what I want to build, this is not what I want. I just kind of looked around and go, oh, let's, we can do this. And the great thing about building here, you're saying so far from home, is because here you can be a lot more creative and almost whatever you can imagine is possible mm -hmm. to build, for example, or create or design. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't cost an arm and a leg. And so the, the risk, in my opinion, is less than mm -hmm. back home. So, you know, building something here would be a fraction of the cost that would be back home. So the risks are not as great. Mm -hmm. And the outcome of being creative is just so much more mm -hmm. exciting, I think. I would have one last question, mm -hmm. but maybe it's a too personal one. Dino, feel free not to answer. Uh, we spoke about risk, mm -hmm. and uh, I would love to know more about your private life. So when you're coming from a half Italian family with this Italian root and family gathering together, mm -hmm. and at the same time you are this entrepreneur with an ongoing mind and spirit, you are a creator, you want to create something. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. But at the same time, you don't have a family for your own or on your own. You're not married. You never were married, right? Not no. as if marriage would, for me, be like the non plus ultra. But um, where do you put in then that private note, that intimacy that you have with a partner, with a lover? Mm. Oh, well, that's a good question. I've had some amazing relationships in my life with some amazing women, very strong women that very strong, successful, and beautiful women in my life that I will never forget and that have, um, that I still have very fond memories. And a lot of them I'm still very good friends mm -hmm. with and will be lifetime friends. And we've spent chapters of our lives together. Um, and I kind of look at life that way. That it's like a book, you know, people can come in and out of your life. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that they're not a part of your life or that you didn't love them, that you don't, you know, you, mm -hmm. that... You don't. You may not have to be in love with them anymore, but you can mm -hmm. still love them for who they are. And I think a lot of people in relationships, you know, write that off, and they love somebody, and then all of a sudden they get into this, this, this part where it's like, oh, I hate you, and like, how could you hate somebody that you loved for mm -hmm. that long, and and then, and then have them not be a part of your life forever. Well, that's how most people are. Um, for me, um, I was never a believer of the, of. Uh, The marriage institution. Um, I maybe I was. Uh, I mean, my parents were were okay, so they they survived the uh, their relationship without divorce. So, um, you know, I can't say that was definitely what uh, affected me or discouraged me from getting married. But I I think I was never able to go down, walk down the aisle, and and really believe at any point in time that I could say that I was going to be with one person for the rest of my life, and that was going to be enough. So I never went, never mentioned those, never had those 
that direction of, of wanting to spend my life with one person. Mm -hmm. I felt that uh, a lot of people could influence my life in and out. I didn't want to uh, to um, jeopardize that or to have it be less free. Mm -hmm. So I think I was always a free spirit that way. Mm -hmm. Um, I love children. I love my ni my nieces, nephews, and if ever children were an option along the way. Outside of maybe the marriage institution, I was always open to it. It just never happened. Who knows? It might still happen. But, um, yeah, I don't have uh, uh, a, a lifetime partner right now. Mm -hmm. But uh, and right now, I'm not that... I just I feel that these days, just right now, at this point in time, I'm very focused on uh, on what I'm doing. I mean, I had a, my last girlfriend was a relationship of four and a half years back home, and uh, it was a good, very nice, lovely relationship. Um, but I I had to come here and 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 follow mm -hmm. this dream of mine, and uh, and long distance relationships don't just work. don't work so I well. I agree. They don't work. So don't work. that's where I find myself. <laughs> Is there time for one last question? Yes. Because I really enjoy talking to you and I like your answers. So I'm keen on that one. Um, I agree um, people come and go because at the end it's also energy between, uh, between the humans, right? And mm. energy comes and goes, emotions. Um, what do you do? I mean, like, um, of course you were left behind and sometimes you were the one, I assume, who said goodbye to, to the partner, to the lover. How can you cope with this process of detachment? Like when you were once close to someone, you shared intimacy. Intimacy is more than just a sexual pleasure. Intimacy is an exchange on different layers, energetic, communication-wise, yeah? So how do you process detachment? Is, is detachment difficult for you? Or is it like when you feel the energy is gone, the emotion is gone, or it's time to move on, to move to Bali, then it's clear for your heart and for your brain to say goodbye, and then it was a chapter, and of course you might stay friends. Or is it like, oh, you still think of her sometimes, and sometimes it's close, I give her a call, but then you don't do it. So what do you do for detachment? Well, I think, um, I think you're very... Uh... I think you, in your question, um, it has all the answers. And I think um, it's not clear, you know. Mm -hmm. Love sometimes is gray. I used to be a very black and white person. Mm -hmm. And it was clear-cut answers, but I don't mm -hmm. find it so clear-cut. Mm -hmm. The older I get, I find it less clear-cut mm -hmm. and, and gray. And I'm okay with gray. I'm okay with not being so clear, not having all the answers, especially when it comes to love and emotion and, mm. and uh, feelings, sometimes they're not clear. Mm. Um, and sometimes they're very, very difficult situations or decisions to make. And of course, I know I have to make them, and so I do them. Mm. And that's, the, uh, that's the practical part of me. I think it's always been more who I am is more practical, mm. even in my design and And what I do, I've been a practical. I, I grew up with practical mm. parents, mm -hmm. and my brothers are practical. I'm practical. Mm -hmm. Sometimes that could be misunderstood as maybe not having, not caring, or not being, not having emotions, or you know, not seeming like I care. But they're there. The feelings are there. And sometimes, yeah, I do feel like picking up the phone. And then sometimes I send messages and say, "Hi, how you doing?" Or, And I do care, but I also know I can't sometimes change the circumstances. Mm -hmm. So sometimes not reaching out as much is not breaking somebody's heart further. Mm. Oh, this is so lovely what you said. Now I'm almost crying. <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> yeah. Uh, not mm -hmm. easy. Mm -hmm. And what I will take with me is this, not to see it in black and white colors, but more in the differences in between and the variations in between the gray color. And sometimes to define doesn't help. No, I think sometimes to try to put things mm. in a box 
mm. is what pe- I think people always try to put things in a box, <laughs> don't you think? I mean, I find everybody wants to categorize and mm. and 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 try to have try to explain a label things. on it. Yeah, try to explain mm. it to their friends. What is it and justify? Because they don't want to be judged by their friends to feel like they're weak mm. or you know or whatever. So I think we we try to categorize, as you say, or try to put them in a box and. I've always lived outside the box. And so I've learned, I keep learning um, not to put everything in a box mm. and try to label it. And sometimes just see what happens. Sometimes you get more for what you expect, right? Just let it be. Live and let live, as my mom said. <laughs> live and let live. And I don't like when people try to put me in a box either. Mm. I just don't like that. Or try to say that they know me because of whatever they think or or judgments. I don't think I don't think it's fair. It's what we do. It's easy to do that, but it's harder not to. And that's a learning process too, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> thank you so much Dino thank you Lena you're a good interviewer <laughs> no it was a pleasure talking to you and um, you opened up so much thank you yeah I didn't expect this today I didn't know that was what I was going to be doing today <laughs> thank you so thank much you. Mm. <laughs> ah, very touching yeah who knew <laughs> Thank you very much for having spent the time together. I really appreciated your presence and I hope you feel inspired now and I could really imagine to live in one of those bamboo houses now. Have a beautiful rest of the day and never forget to keep on shining. And before I forget to mention, if you want to find out more about Dino, don't hesitate to have a look in the show notes to contact him and to stop by should you be close by. Again, keep on shining. Yours, Corina Rosa.